All right, RJ, we are here for the much anticipated trade deadline recap. A lot of people have been asking us for this. They were asking for it in the lead up. We had to get it done. We were trying to wait out all of the trade deadline deals. However, one is still hanging in the balance. Incredibly. <laughs> yes, we'll get to that uh, later. Well, I think we should probably save that one for last. Um, we are not going to go over all of the trades, everybody. I'm sorry. We're not going to go through all like, you know, 200. It seemed like there was yesterday. Um, that is the job of the one person who sits on the end of the line that all the teams are on hold with that has to somehow manually input all of these trades. I assume with like an abacus or something because it takes so long. <laughs> I don't know how the NHL bureaucracy works. I just know it's outdated. Um, yeah. We do know fax machines are involved somehow, so that should tell you everything you need to know. That really does tell you a lot. Um, one other thing to quickly go over, if we brush over, you know, AHL players involved in a trade, prospects involved in a trade, um, we are not trying to, you know, act like they don't factor into it at all or that they're not really a part of it. It's just they're not the key focal point of the trade. We do understand that it is, you know, it upsets their life. When they are traded as well, they are moving teams as well. It's just we're, we're trying to get through as many of these as we can in a nice, concise little video for everybody. So just want to throw that out there. And then before we break down the trades individually, RJ, I want to bring up something else that became clear over this trade deadline, and that was the increased use of future drafts picks. Lots of trades involving 2023 draft picks and 2024 draft picks. Like, you know, every so often you'll see one from like three drafts out. But this year you started to see that a lot. We did. And it was an interesting case. I can't remember any prior deadline where we saw so many picks traded that far out. Even some that with conditions could be a 2025 pick. Mm -hmm. uh, so lots of picks out into the future. And it's interesting thinking about the next two draft classes, you know, maybe why that might be. And uh, Ron Francis was asked about this. You know, we got to speak with Ron Francis yesterday and asked about kind of the dynamic between the next two draft classes this year versus the next year. And I thought his comment on that was interesting. He said something to the effect of, you know, look, there there are probably about three players at the top of next year's draft class that by themselves would be at the top of this year's draft class, you know, maybe a, a, above anyone else in this year's draft class. And he said, you know, this year's class does still have some good players, but and, you know, and then went on to qualify. You know, every draft class has good players yeah. and whatnot. Uh, but that's kind of what he had to say. And maybe that was some of the thinking uh, behind these moves for future draft picks. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly got to think that you're factoring in the fact that, um, you know, Connor Bedard is available next draft when you're trading your 2023 fourth rounder somewhere. Or you're <laughs> asking for a 2023 fourth rounder. That's, I'm sure, is really what was going on with all these general managers i don't know that I've, I've understood the whole idea that next year's draft class is better but but everyone then just focuses on the top of that draft class i'm like that doesn't impact these mid-round picks that you're trading three drafts from now like what is <laughs> that somehow magically turns into the first overall pick for you i don't know so i i don't know that i totally buy it i think realistically what it is is general managers are just getting smarter for the first time ever rj and we saw this <laughs> at the expansion draft in how many teams were, you know, not really in the market to make a deal with the Kraken. They were willing to just, you know, kind of suck it up and lose a player instead um, or not try to force a bad contract out of town. They, they determined it was a better idea to hold on to draft assets. Um, and I think that they're just placing more value on that. And no team wants to just kind of gut one draft to help out their team this year. They're going to try to spread that pain around if possible i think is is what it what it's about trying to mitigate the losses in any one particular draft class which you know it's it's interesting we're going to see if this becomes the new normal or maybe this was just a one year fluky thing it is but you you see this in other areas just of life you know in, in finance mm -hmm. and everything you know I, i'm an economics major and i'm familiar with the idea of you know kind of amortizing uh costs you know, mm -hmm. spreading them out over over a number of years. And I think that's, you know, maybe it's the the modern, you know, GM and the modern hockey ops staff that that probably employs some people from finance or from other fields where, you know, this is something that's more commonly done. Uh, but I could certainly see it sticking around just because it's done in a lot of other industries. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Uh, and, you know, 
we'll see. There's also the financial aspect of, you know, kitchen sinking a quarter. Just <laughs> trying to sink all costs into this. And I think that that can be said about the teams that are really trying to make, you know, moves for the cup this year. I think there, there are also still those that'll potentially do that down the road. Um, I do think that it's also interesting. I think this largely comes from COVID and what it did to all of the draft classes. And, and how you know it impacted not just development for those players, but the team's ability to see them play because they just weren't playing games. I think that has some factor into it as well. I think they're a little afraid of this draft class, kind of like they were last year where it was just a lot of question marks. Exactly. <laughs> um, all right, so let's go ahead and get into the trades. We've kind of got um, you know what, um, what we determined the top tier trades to be. We're going to go back a little bit over a week ago and start with the Josh Manson to Colorado trade in exchange for Drew Helson and a 2023 second round pick going back to Anaheim in exchange for Josh Manson. We've talked about this before on the Red Glare podcast, RJ. Josh Manson, stay at home kind of guy, good defenseman. He's very effective in his own zone. It was just is that really what's going to benefit Colorado? I made the point of, I really want to see Colorado just go all out on offense. Just try to outscore and outskate everybody. And it would certainly be interesting to see. I think you take kind of their moves at the deadline, all of them into account. And they definitely didn't go in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, and Manson kind of fits with the direction they tried to go. And again, I'm not against acquiring some bigger, more physical players that are going to help you in the playoffs. Cause I really do believe it helps but I don't know how much Manson fits on that blue line. And as a defenseman, how effectively he's going to be able to be a bruiser like that. I tend to like forwards who are going to go getting on the four check and, you know, and, and kind of beat up the other team's defensemen. Uh, so we'll see how it turns out for Colorado. Although I will say on the return, it, it looks a little better for them knowing what the D market turned out to be. It's always tough when you're the first players in the trade market and you kind of have to set the price. And I think it's looked better since we talked about it last. Uh, I will agree with that. That being said, I still think the Ducks walk away the winners of this trade. Uh, Agreed. Because you're getting rid of an expiring contract. You were not going to re-sign Manson, both with Manson, and we'll get to the Lindholm deal in a, in a little bit. The Ducks you know, basically explored extensions with both of them, determined that they weren't on the same page, so they decided to ship them out of town. Um, and if you're Anaheim, you get a really good prospect in Drew Helson, former second-round pick, who looks very close to being NHL ready. My guess is he will be with the Anaheim Ducks next season to start the year. And um, a second round pick for, again, a guy that was just going to walk away and you were going to lose for nothing in a month and a half or two months. So, exactly. Great, great job by the Ducks there. Um, moving on to kind of the next big rental defenseman trade and this was i think the one that everyone expected to be the big domino that was then gonna you know have all the other ones go and that is of course ben Sherratt going to the florida panthers in exchange for a prospect a 2022 fourth round pick and a 2023 first round pick that's all going back to montreal tons of conditions on both of those picks based mm -hmm. off of really a lot of stuff like there are full paragraphs written about the conditions involving these picks right now but the bottom line is and remember if we're glossing over all the paragraphs about the conditions conditions are people too we, we acknowledge this yeah, they, you gotta move on and yes do this quickly. The lawyers lawyers have to write those it employs them as we all know that is you know a, a very big deal and we should all be very very happy about that right rj um Bottom line, though, is it's Ben Sherratt going for a first, a fourth, and a prospect. It seems like a very healthy return for a defenseman that, again, on an expiring deal, and one who is maybe a little bit limited in what he's going to bring to the table for your team. Exactly. And this was kind of a topic of conversation leading into the trade deadline. Everyone knew Sherratt was going to get moved. Uh, everyone knows kind of what he does and, <laughs> and you know, how... He's maybe a little limited as far as what he can, you know, do on the offensive side of the puck or, or even, you know, defensively, you look at, at some of the metrics, they don't look all that good. The advanced stats, uh, is he going to go for a first? Is he not? And he goes for a first more. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the Habs really able to maximize their return for him. So I, I think they do quite well in this trade on Florida side. Yes, I do think he's going to make them incrementally better in the playoffs. 
Yeah, I think they are a better team bringing him in. You know, he's not going to make them worse, despite what some of the advanced stats say. Uh, but and it's going to help in a, in a matchup with, that you think is probably coming with the Tampa Bay Lightning, yes. where they're a tough team to play against. You want to rough them up. It, it's just it's going to be an all out battle. And Sherratt will help you with that. But as far as the price to pay, uh, I, they really went all out this year. I, they kind of have this whole kitchen sink mentality of just mm-hmm. throw everything at this year. And it really set the tone for the outrageous uh, rental defenseman market this year. Uh, it, it did. Um, I will say I was more critical of this pre Aaron blood injury. I think that right. helps now. It's like, okay, well, that loss is not maybe as big a deal because you have Sherratt there to help out. But yes, I agree. This was done with, Tampa and probably also a Carolina figuring you might have to run into them at some point too um, with those teams in mind you need somebody who's going to be able to clear guys out from in front of your goaltender so that they can see it's something that you know kind of make becomes a bigger deal in the playoffs than it probably um, is in the regular season for whatever reason I'd argue that should be a big deal every night but Comes a big deal in the playoffs. You need somebody who can deal with the Corey Perrys on the Lightning and everything. And uh, Sherratt's capable of doing that. And um, we did see, you know, he played pretty well in the, in the playoffs last year for Montreal. It's just, it, it's a it's a big return. That being said, yes, Florida is going for it this year. I think it's the right move for Florida. You kind of have to if you're Florida. This, this team looks ready. It feels ready. You might as well go for it. I'm in favor of that. So overall, it's probably going to be a win-win for both sides, unless Florida, like you know, loses in the second round. Then it's then it's going to look pretty disappointing for them. Yeah, I think. All right, uh, where are we going next here, RJ? Well, let's go ahead and talk about the Tampa Bay Lightning because they did something too. They brought in Brandon Hagel along with a. Uh, 2022 fourth round pick and a 2024 fourth round pick from Chicago in exchange for Taylor Radish, um, Boris Kachuk, and a 2023 first round pick and a 2024 first round pick. Both are top 10 protected. Big return for somebody that I think most NHL fans didn't know existed. Agreed. Uh, I, I We did because uh, Hagel was actually one of the guys that we scouted quite a bit in the mm-hmm. lead up to the expansion draft where we figured maybe at the start of last season, Oh, this guy could be available. He could be a good get for the Kraken. And then we quickly realized that, no, he was not going to be exposed in the expansion draft. Uh, he was better than that. And he's really come on these, these last couple seasons and he just fits the exact template for the kind of acquisition uh, that the lightning have made over the last three years and what has helped win them to Stanley cups. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have a good middle six forward who can slot in anywhere, someone who's going to be able to fit really well with this lineup. And the most important thing in this entire deal is Hagel's contract. Yeah. He is under contract for another two years after this one at $1.5 million a year, which is an absolute steal for the player that he is. And the lightning I went, identified him and got the guy that's going to help. And, you know, at, at that point, they don't really care what it's going to cost. You saw that with Blake mm-hmm. Coleman. You saw that with Barkley Goodrow. We we have our guy we have identified. He's under contract with term and we'll pay whatever we need to pay to get him. Yeah. And, you know, on the one hand, I'm very like in favor of that. I love when GMs actually commit to something like that and they act very confidently because they don't always do that. And so I, I really like that. That being said, two firsts for for somebody that, you know, you could maybe get similar production just signing somebody in free agency each year, just a one-year contract. Like like I said, Corey Perry earlier, look at how much value he's brought to them for very cheap cost. You know what I mean? Like there's always guys like that, um, as we saw in Seattle with Marcus Johansson. Mm-hmm. Cheap guy you can just sign, bring in, probably going to have similar production just because you're Tampa and you have supremely skilled players all over your lineup guys are going to put up numbers just by nature of being next to them you know what i mean out on the ice i i just don't know that they needed to give up two first round picks to bring in it just a cheap winger essentially yeah and i do think that hagel brings significantly more than a replacement player you know replacement free agent would and i know it's hard to say in the in the tampa system and everything with 
you know, how much talent they have around everyone, it's going to make everyone look good. And we, again, we haven't seen, you know, what Hagel's going to be like with the lightning, but I do think he brings a kind of a level above that, that, that does justify the cost. I mean, he does bring a 22.3% shooting percentage with him. Over I figured Chicago. you might bring that up. <laughs> Obviously that's not sustainable, but even you take the player he was last season and what his career shooting percentage is. And I think it still makes sense. Yeah, it's closer to 10, which is still pretty good. I mean, look, he's going to be a 20-goal scorer. It's just, I don't know if you can't find guys in the free agent market every year willing to go there on a one-year deal, chase a cup, that are going to be able to score 20 goals playing with the players you have. You know what I mean? That's that's kind of just where I'm coming from uh, when it comes to this. That being said, like, you know, Tampa, they've been a step ahead of everybody for years now. They know what they're doing, so who am I to question really um, i suppose i'm inclined to give them the benefit of the doubt exactly they've earned it i think we can we can all agree on that all right so then we get back to another rental defenseman although this defenseman did sign you know day of his trade uh and that is of course hampus lindholm going to the boston bruins in exchange for uh, you know a couple ahlers slash prospect level guys and then a 2022 first round pick to the Ducks alongside a 2023 second rounder and a 2024 second rounder. So again, Boston kind of spreading out the pain in the return. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's kind of a sign and trade of Hampus Lindholm going to Boston, signs an eight-year extension there with a cap hit of, I believe, uh, six and a half million mm -hmm. for a first and two seconds, which is a very, very substantial return for, again, a guy that the Ducks explored doing an extension with couldn't come to terms with and we're just gonna have to see walk out the door come july exactly and the ducks did a great job maximizing their return on on lindholm and manson a pair of assets mm -hmm. that they had to decide on in really a short period of time especially with lindholm i think the plan was probably to re-sign him and then yes. once you became aware that he wasn't going to re-sign you had to move him quickly and they did a great job really maximizing the return there. I think it also helped that it sounds like they let him talk to Boston and, and yeah. make it clear to Boston that yes, an extension could be worked out. And that's why you see such a big return on this trade. Boston, knowing that it's not just a rental, you're going to get this guy for, you know, eight and a half seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that helps there. Uh, what do you think about the return? Like on Boston side of the trade though, though, do they give up too much? I mean, it's, it's hard to say. I've always been a very, very big Hampus Lindholm fan. I've thought that he kind of fell into early stage Drew Doughty uh, out here on the West Coast where like nobody was staying up to watch these West Coast Ducks games because, you know, all right, they're a good team, but they're not an ultra competitive team. And, um, you know, as as we know, most of the hockey world is centered on the East Coast, up in the Northeast, especially, and in Canada. And you just you know, time difference, right? Nobody's staying up till one in the morning to make sure that they catch the end of, you know, Ducks Coyotes, right? I can't blame them. I don't stay up till 10 to watch the end of some of those games. So, but Lindholm has been a, a supremely underrated defenseman for years playing in Anaheim. He's been one of the best defensemen in the league. I think, you know, certainly for a short stretch a couple of years ago, I think you could say that. So I think Boston is going to bring in a guy that is going to be good. I think his style of play is going to age very nicely. I know this extension is going to take him until he's 37. I think that's going to be okay for him. Like, yeah, maybe those last couple of years at the end there aren't, aren't going to be great, but they they rarely are, and it's the price you pay to get a $6.5 million cap hit for a guy who could be on your top pairing if you needed him to, but certainly going to be rock solid in your top four um, I think as the cap continues to go up, that cap hit's only going to look even more attractive as the years go by. I'm really surprised. I know the Ducks wanted to keep him. I'm surprised. It sounds like the sticking point was term. I'm, I'm surprised the Ducks weren't willing to give him those eight years. It's tough when you're coming out of a rebuild. You kind of want flexibility there, especially knowing that you've got guys like Zegers and Drysdale, who if you give uh, you know Lindholm eight years that's going to overlap with those big contracts you're going to have to give uh, to Zegers and Drysdale. So I understand wanting as much flexibility as you can get there. And certainly if you feel you can get the kind of return that the Ducks did, yeah. uh, that's going to give you options to do other things. Yeah. Um, although it, it's going to be interesting with the Ducks, like their window, they overachieved a little bit this year. Their window is starting to look closer 
than maybe you know having a 2024 second rounder is going to look but um i think that they're going to utilize those at either the draft this year or certainly next year's trade deadline would be my guess is these picks are going to be brought up again um all right so from rental defenseman rj to rental center former superstar still pretty good player that is, of course, Claude Giroux going to the Florida Panthers, going apparently to the only place he wanted to go, which was the Florida Panthers, um, alongside a couple other players and a fifth round pick. On Philly's side, they are getting former first round pick Owen Tippett alongside a 2023 third round pick and a 2024 first round pick. <laughs> Kind of crazy that that is top 10 protected and could become a 2025 first round pick. So from one trade where the Ducks get this absolute bounty for a rental defenseman to this other trade where the Flyers giving up a guy who has been their franchise cornerstone for years for a first round pick. Yeah, you get that. But it's three drafts from now. It shows the power of basically a monopoly. I mean, mm-hmm. Giroux made it clear. It, it was reported that Florida was the only destination that he was willing to go. And it sounded like Florida knew that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, in some ways you almost might be surprised the price was as high as it was just because, yeah. you know, Philly's only recourse is just to keep Giroux and, and then everyone's mad at you after that. Um, so it's it's a tough trade for the Flyers to have to make. You're, you're just in a bad spot necessarily and i i'm not as hard on them as maybe some other people are on, as far as the return just knowing that that's the spot they were in a- and that they also reportedly waited until florida up their offer at least a little bit uh mm-hmm. from the reports i you know that they were hearing from like elliot friedman and such the the offer was actually less than this at first because florida do that they had uh, the flyers over a barrel but yeah. uh at least you waited got a little something more it sounds like so I'm I'm going to, you know, not be too hard on them. You have to grade on a curve a little bit on a deal like this. That, but that for is, Florida, yeah. it's it's a great deal. Yeah, that is true. Um, Florida gets an absolute steal. Like I said, Giroux is not the player he once was. He's not going to be putting up 100-point seasons anymore. That being said, he doesn't have to be that guy in Florida. He gets to slide in, be a, a middle six center. Uh, he can play on the wing if you need him to. Most importantly, he's right-handed. I think at one point this season, Florida was playing with their entire top nine, all being lefties. So you get some variety in there. That is the spice of life after all. Um, yeah, it's it's a good move for them. Giroux going to, I think, being on a very competitive team come playoff time is going to kind of help him, you know, reawaken some of the stuff that you know is still in there. We see that every year at the deadline, guys that are getting older, but kind of get a chance to be on a good team again. Uh, look at Jeff Carter last year and everything Mm -hmm. he's done in Pittsburgh since going there from LA, right? It's just, you know, reinvigorated him completely. I think this move has the same potential for Giroux. Very excited to see what he can do in Florida. It makes Florida all that much more scary moving forward. And if you're Philly, you do get to say that you got a first round pick back, which is basically what you had to do. Like you were going to get destroyed, especially in Philly. You were going to get destroyed if you couldn't say that. Um, You can just kind of gloss over the fact that it's, you know, it's going to eventually be be here. Don't ask what year. It's a first round pick. Yeah. Um, Also, Owen Tippett. I know a lot of people were talking about him. He's just one of those guys where I think part of it has been he's been stuck in that Florida Panther system where there's just a massive logjam of forwards there. I do think that he has a very, very good shot, and um, I, I'm excited to see him kind of get more opportunity now in in uh, the Flyers system because I think that he can be good. Definitely someone who could have used the change of scenery. Yeah, yeah. excited to see what he can do. Yeah. Um, all right, so the big one for the Kraken – was, of course, the Mark Giordano and Colin Blackwell trade, both going to the Toronto Maple Leafs in exchange for 2022 second round pick, 2023 second round pick, 2024 third round pick. So we've talked about this yesterday on the deep dive in a lot of depth, obviously. That's where we're covering all of the Kraken trades. But just as a quick recap, RJ, would have loved to see a first comeback for Geo understand kind of why it didn't happen especially with you know francis not being put over the barrel like 
Giroud did with the Flyers, but Ron Francis still wanting to honor Gio and the you know legendary career that he's had and everything by sending him to a preferred destination. It's the Blackwell thing that I'm just, I'm not sure I'm ever going to get over, essentially trading him for a third round pick uh, and a third round pick three years from now. Again, I can't get over those either. Um, that's just, it's rough for me because I really wanted to see him hang around. I did too. And and that is really tough to see him go. Uh, it's a tough trade here because Seattle did sacrifice value, I think. I understand why they did it. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, Blackwell being involved is rough. Although on the flip side, good for Toronto. I think he's the exact yes. type of player they need to bring in. Yeah. Uh, and that's just really good for them. I understand why they would want to target him. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's a great pickup for them. Uh, great that you could get the Kraken to do that and ultimately not have to pay too much to get it done. I think the value is really good for Toronto in this deal. Yes. But I still don't know that it really moves the needle as far as how they're going to perform in the playoffs this year. Uh, I I just can't see them getting past any of these major players in the East. I was going to say, that being said, if it gets them out of the first round, it was worth it. Right. You know like, what? I think that is kind of where we're at with them now. That is the standard. If you can just end that first round exit meme, you've accomplished something. Yeah, um, I think because that's that's where you can s- start. Certainly, if you're the management team in Toronto and the coaching staff and and you know all of that, um, you need to do that because that has been the sticking point for you and your job and all the stress that you have to deal with on a daily basis has been built around this one thing. If you do that, you can free it up. And of course you get that monkey also off the back of all you know, your star players. And I do think that Geo and especially Blackwell is going to help them probably do that. I, I think Toronto can get out of the first round with the team that they have this year. I don't know that they can go very far past there, but we'll see. <laughs> um, all right, next one. Big, big trade. Talk about, you know, kind of freeing somebody from a bad situation here, RJ. And that is Marc-Andre Fleury going from the uh, Chicago Blackhawks to the Minnesota Wild in exchange for a second round pick that can be upgraded to a first round pick if the Wild reach the Western Conference Finals. Um, and if Fleury has four wins in those first two rounds, blah, 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 blah. Again, <laughs> lawyer stuff. Um, Flower. Oh, my gosh. I was so happy for him. Uh, getting out of the you know the Chicago organization that has ma- done a lot of things that has made it very very hard to root for them and the players that <laughs> that play for them unfortunately um, gets to go to the Wild Wild look like they can really be kind of a surprise competitive team goaltending and certainly you know goals allowed anyway was the one thing that I felt like was holding them back Flower should you know help them deal with that. It's going to be a huge boost for the Wild, and I love this trade, really for all parties involved, but we'll start with Minnesota. There are few players traded at this deadline who could be more impactful to a team's playoff run than Marc-Andre Fleury. I mean, I think he's got probably the biggest upside to impact Mm -hmm. a playoff run, just given the position he plays and given what we know he can do in net. And you get him for basically a second round pick. You talk about all these prices all these other teams are paying for guys they're bringing in. This is one of the cheaper ones. And yes, I I know it can turn into a first, but that's if you make the conference final and he's playing games for you and helping you there. You don't mind it at that point. That already means you've won the trade. Exactly. So you're not worried about it uh, at that point. So I I love this trade uh, for for Minnesota, for Flurry too. It would have been such a waste to see him just languish in Chicago for the rest of the season, you know, not going to make the playoffs. I think he deserves a shot to go and, and, and show what he can do with a playoff team. And then for Chicago, I still think it's a a good deal because basically you got him for free at the start of the season. You get something for him. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a success. That's good asset management. Uh, Exactly. I think the other big thing is, and we saw this last night with him getting to Minnesota you still have Talbot if you're Minnesota. He's still playing well. Gets a shutout over Vegas. Nice welcome, you know, to the team present for for Flower there. Um, and I think that's a big deal because with Flower, obviously going back to his Pittsburgh days and everything, all of the bad postseason runs Flower has had have come from seasons in which he's played more than fifty games. All right, and he's played forty five games so far this season. So I think if you're Minnesota, you bring him in. But if you really want him to be your playoff guy, just sprinkle him in, keep him warm for the playoffs. But 
Go ahead and keep your tandem. You seem pretty much locked into a playoff spot. Just ride that out and and then bring in Flower, hopefully a little fresher for the postseason run. Um, but that would be my advice to them is, is don't overuse him here in the regular season. When you really don't need him, that's not why you brought him in. You brought him in for the playoffs. Keep him, keep him ready for that. Uh, otherwise, I think he should be great for them. And just, just having him in a locker room, I think, does a lot for any team you know what I mean like even if you know other goaltender gets hot and you kind of go with them in the playoffs just having him around we saw that in Pittsburgh you know what I mean he was still a big part of those Penguins teams that won those two cups uh, in 2015 or 2016 2017 sitting on the bench just because of everything that he can bring so um, good move and I agree with you if that pick has to turn into a first you've already won that trade massively because that means you got past Colorado for one (laughs) somehow (laughs) you made it through that so good good for you um all right so that was a good one let's see where we going next RJ let's talk about this Andrew Kopp trade that I think kind of (laughs) kind of came out of nowhere and this return is so crazy so the Rangers get forward Andrew Kopp from the Winnipeg Jets alongside a 2023 sixth round pick from Winnipeg. In exchange, the Jets acquire an NHLer and two second round picks this year and a fifth round pick in 2023. Now those two second round picks, they can turn into, the one can turn into a first round pick. The other one can be swapped for a 2023 second round pick. But the bottom line is Andrew Kopp bringing in two seconds for you. That's a big return for a guy that, you know, it's a nice step forward to have. But, I, I again, somebody that I don't think, bro, you know, NHL-wide fans really think about on a daily basis. Exactly. And I think it's tough to, you know, gauge this trade. I think the Rangers may have waited out some things in the deadline and, and look, then you feel like you need to add and who's left on the market and you're going to be en- ending up paying some higher prices. Um I, I do think it's relevant here. The pick upgrades to a first if you win two playoff rounds and cop like plays fifty percent of the time. So mm-hmm. it's something that it's kind of like the flurry thing, basically, yeah. where you know it'll upgrade to a first, but you're feeling good about it if it does. Mm-hmm. I, I still think the value is quite a bit <laughs> for yeah. for a middle six forward. But uh, on the other hand, I do think cop is actually a really good fit for this Rangers team, just given his style of play, and he's someone that we watched. Uh, in Winnipeg when we were scouting, we were scouting a lot of Mason Appleton, but we, he was on a line with cop and I believe Lowry uh, mm-hmm. for pretty much all that time we were watching him. So we saw a lot of cop and I'd like what he did on that line. Uh, and I think he's a good fit for a Gerard Gallant team for, for this yes. Rangers team. So I, I, I don't want to grade it too harshly because I think they did identify the right player there, mm-hmm. but waiting that long, waiting till right before the deadline, I, I think the value wasn't that good. Yeah, um, he's a really good player. He's got decent size, very responsible defensively. He can help drive possession a lot, while at the same time showing that you know he could he could maybe start flirting with twenty goals if put in the right situation. Um, I think that's a big deal too. He does have that scoring upside in addition to being responsible and being able to you know play on your third line and and make a real impact there for you. So in that sense, I, I think it's okay. It's just, yeah, like I said, it's 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 a lot of return for a rental. Like that's <laughs> that's the other thing. He is a rental. And he's going to be a UFA. Like you, you, there's no team control here. Like that you're keeping if you're if if you're the Rangers. So it's it's going to be interesting. I don't know how competitive the Rangers are going to be come postseason time. I don't know that they needed to do this. Really, looking at their it window. feels like yeah, it feels like you know their their windows uh, you know a little ways out. And also this year, it feels like you're just so dependent on goaltending. Like if Shesterkin is the goalie in the playoffs that he's been in the regular season, you're going to do well almost no matter what. Yeah. And if he's not, then you're you're not. Uh, I I don't know how much this moves the needle for them, but it, it's it's a solid pickup. But man, are you paying a premium for it? Yeah. And on the Winnipeg side, good for you. You got a ton of assets. I don't really know where Winnipeg's at franchise wise are they rebuilding are they trying to do a quick retool like it kind of seems like that based on some of the moves they made this deadline but but i think retool is the word yeah i mean you you 
obviously get rid of cop knowing that it, he's going to be a ufa you get some assets back you bring in a couple players you bring in mason appleton you bring in i believe zach sanford was the other mm -hmm. one it it just looks like a retool to me and for an organization that's really right in that spot you don't want to be right outside the playoff bubble but solidly there uh some changes do need to be made yeah i think they're going to be very active this off season next trade we're going to discuss this one i you know this was a player that was kind of known and shopped around a little bit last year at the trade deadline. Uh, knew that their future in Anaheim was less than solid. And that is, of course, Ricard Raquel. That being said, kind of fell, you know, off the map. Like after last year, it wasn't moved. It just kind of disappeared. Um, and then, oh, yeah, no, trade deadline. Oh, yeah, Ricard Raquel. Yeah, it wasn't going to be a duck long term. I uh, forgot about that. Going from one aquatic bird team in the ducks to the other in the penguins. You know how much I love any deal involving both of these two teams, RJ. Um, Ricard Raquel goes to the penguins in exchange for Dominic Simone, Zach Aston Reese, uh, Kale Clegg, the goaltending prospect, and a 2022 second round pick. So, again, the ducks getting a very, very healthy return. Um, for a player that was just going to walk away come July. Yeah, it's a good return. Uh, and again, for pending UFA, that's that's a lot. And Raquel, it's tough to gauge because he's a two-time 30-goal scorer, mm -hmm. you know, not too, too long ago, but he's just really fallen off production-wise. And how much do you blame the situation in Anaheim for that? How much do you blame him? It's really hard to gauge. And the Penguins, I think they're hoping that they have another Jeff Carter type situation on their hands, where once you put him in the right spot, once you get him out of a lowly California team, uh, that he's going to turn things around and do really well for you. And if that's the case, then the return makes sense. And the price you paid is is actually a bargain. So we'll see what it turns out to be. Yeah, kind of kind of staying on that note, his production has almost directly followed the Ducks as a franchise. When they were a playoff team and everything was cooking, he was fantastic. That's when you're seeing those 33, 34 goal seasons from him. The moment they stopped being that, the production dipped. This year, production back up. 16 goals in 51 games as the team is kind of on the upswing. I think he's been right there with the team. In that sense, he kind of plays up or down to the level of line mates he has and the level of help around him he has, the defensive matchups he's having to deal with, right? Um, which should not be a problem in Pittsburgh. Playing with some good players, you're never going to have to go up against the top defensive matchup. Like, you don't have to worry about that in Pittsburgh. So I do think that he is um, a prime candidate to, you know, do a lot for the Penguins this season uh, as they try to make, you know, maybe one last run. Uh, depending mm -hmm. on how things shake out with them and all their pending UFAs. Uh, so I think it's a, it's going to be a good spot for Raquel, get to kind of, you know, like you said, reinvigorate himself, get good. On the Ducks side of things, one of the things I want to talk about was you bring in a couple depth players, but you also bring in another top-ish prospect and uh, alongside the second round pick. And I think that that makes a lot of sense for the Ducks because if you're looking at, at it, you have Drysdale already. You have Zegris already for sure. Um, Mason McTavish, who you selected third overall this season, has already played games for you and looked very effective at the NHL level. Your rebuild is very much ahead of schedule. You do not want to be loading up on picks a year or two from now. Those are not going to help you at the appropriate time. So I like them kind of targeting prospects that they think are going to be useful for them you know, next season because I think that's when they really want to kind of kickstart this run. Agreed. And Dominic Simone, Zach Aston Reese, you know, those aren't just names to be glossed over. Zach Aston Reese, particularly, mm -hmm. he does a lot of things kind of under the radar as a defensive depth forward. He's someone we looked a lot uh, at a lot yeah. ahead of the expansion draft as someone that, that might be a sneaky good pickup for the Kraken. Uh, and, and I think you have the high end talent. You've already got those guys, in the organization ready to go in Zegris and McTavish, what you don't have is the right depth pieces to build around them. And with this trade, you're using that to, to get those in place. Yeah. Now it is worth noting both Simone and Aston Reese are UFAs. So the ducks have to resign them. That being said, mm -hmm. the ducks have proven in years past, you can win guys over once you get them into that building. 
once you get them living in Southern California, dealing with that weather <laughs> and, and just the energy and, and it's a very family based atmosphere that are in Anaheim and the way that the team is always there for each other and supports each other. Um, we have seen people w been very willing to stay after a uh, short stints there. So I don't think it'll be a huge problem for the ducks and you get a, a good, um, a good, uh, uh, goaltending prospect in there as well gibson can't last forever right gotta gotta start thinking <laughs> about that um all right moving on to the next one this one three team deal rj finally got one uh once everything was all said and done here so the 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 center piece of this deal is max domi going from carolina to uh, going excuse me going from columbus to carolina via florida mm -hmm. all right so let's, let's see. So Carolina ends up with Max Domi and the signing rights uh, to a player. Uh, Columbus ends up with the signing rights to, how did we decide we were pronouncing this name? Aiden Preschuk? Aiden Preschuk? Preschuk? Yeah. Um, and if you're Florida, you end up with a sixth round pick this year and some signing rights to a player. So what kind of confuses me about this trade, RJ, is that I don't know really where the value went in exchange for Domi. Right. I was expecting to see something on the other end of this, you know, one of the two other ends. Uh, you just see Max Domi and then a whole lot of prospects. I think probably the centerpiece going back, because you look at Florida's part, they're basically paid a sixth round and some signing rights to retain, you know, a quarter of that deal. So that's, yeah. that's what they're doing. Um, but uh, on the... On the um, Columbus, Columbus end, thank you. On the Columbus end, all they're getting basically in exchange for Domi here is Aiden Preschuk. Now, he was a third round pick in 2021, so very recent third round mm -hmm. pick. You could basically say it's like, you know, getting a third round pick back. So if you look at it that way, there's some value there. But for a player like Max Domi, given what we've seen other forward rentals go for, it's awfully light. And that's why, again, I love this deal for Carolina. Just very little downside, and Max Domi could help you potentially a lot in a playoff run. Right. I mean, very kind of comparable player, I think, to Cop, who we were just talking about, as far as being a depth option that's going to be kind of responsible for you with some scoring upside, can help you out in certain situations. Like, I, I don't know. It, just, it was just kind of very, very surprising. I get... That, you know, things were not going to work out long term in Columbus for him. That was clear. So Columbus gets something for him. It was just odd it, on a day in which, as there is with most trade deadlines, right? You overpay for guys. That's just kind of how it goes usually um, to just get seemingly not really anything back is just kind of surprising at least from like a, oh we got a second rounder or we got a whatever for him you know what i mean like most gms <laughs> want to be able to take back to their their fan base because after having this bad season and that's why you're a seller you want to sell them on the future a little bit and i don't know that columbus um totally gets to do that here it seems like this isn't the first time we've seen this with Max Domi either. I mean, he wasn't protected in the expansion draft. Mm -hmm. The Kraken declined to take him in the expansion draft, took basically nobody over him. Yeah. Uh, it, it just seems like this, this is now a recurring thing. Yeah. You could at least say the contract was part of that with Seattle. Like they didn't want to take on that deal maybe, even though it was only going to be for the one year. I don't know. There's, there is other stuff involved with him off ice stuff, I guess as well. Um, maybe that factored in here. I, I don't know. I don't know that that always does when it comes to trade deadline day. We've seen but Caroline stuff. Carolina's involved. made it clear they will take advantage of market inefficiencies like that, though. They're yeah. not afraid to. That is true. That is true. All right, RJ, the time has come to talk <laughs> about the, the trade that, I mean, I haven't checked Twitter since we started recording. Maybe it has been resolved, but as of, you know, my understanding, it has not yet. And that is another trade involving the Ducks very very active at this deadline and the vegas golden knights so genny dodonov to the ducks alongside a 2024 second round pick conditional because of course it has to be conditional in exchange for ryan kessler's contract essentially and john moore who the ducks had acquired in the um not the manson deal but the lindholm deal mm -hmm. so 
It's really just a cap dump for Vegas. They needed to become cap compliant after some of the other deals they were doing and the fact that they have so much you know, cap buried on long-term IR right now. Um, they need to do that. Kessler's contract, they can immediately put on long-term IR, get it out of the way. Could not do that with the other one. That being said, RJ, I mean, do you want to take everybody kind of through what, as we, as far as we understand, is the issue here? Right. So the trade is one thing and it, and it makes sense, you know, as far as the trade on paper, but mm-hmm. There were some issues here with whether or not the trade was allowed and the whole story of it going through the league registry. So uh, some issues came up, I guess it was first reported. So basically, Dodonov had, and Dodonov, Dadonov, he's he's had it both ways over the course of his career. It's like Johansson, Johansson. But anyway, I'm going to say Dodonov. So he had a, uh, I believe, 10 team no trade clause. So he submits a list of 10 teams that he is not allowed to be traded to. That's part of his contract. And so the trade goes through and everything. And then it becomes apparent that Dodonov had his 10 team, no trade list and the ducks were one of the teams on it. So he should not be allowed to be traded to the ducks. But then word comes out that that trade, no trade list was actually not submitted to Vegas uh, at, at all so the ducks and the golden knights and the league made this trade put it through the registry and everything all of unaware that dodonov had the ducks as one of the 10 teams he could not be traded to then things got even weirder when it seemed that i think it was reported that dodonov his 10 team no trade list wasn't submitted at the time when he was traded from ottawa to vegas last season Mm -hmm. And then there was the question of, was this 10 team, no trade list ever submitted? Right. Uh, And then coming out today, I guess Dodonov's camp and his agent insist that yes, this trade, no trade list was submitted. It seems like there's email proof that it was submitted to Vegas and corresponding that they said, okay, yes, we've got it. We confirmed that we have it. So now this looks pretty bad on Vegas that they should have known also on the league that, you should have verified this, you know, yes. is this allowed? And I, I guess the ducks are the only team coming out of this where it doesn't look really bad on them, but still uh, not good for any of the sides involved. It, it's still an unresolved matter. We'll see what becomes of it. Uh, but it's, it's just, it's just bad. <laughs> it is really bad. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy. Cause I know, you know, Ottawa is involved in this too because Ottawa traded him to Vegas. And I, and I know that I had seen that he had submitted his uh, no trade list. He had to submit it but prior to July, and he submitted it to Ottawa and the, and the league reportedly on June 30th. So it should have all been good last year, and this is of last year. Gets traded to Vegas, but Vegas was saying that they were not informed about this list when they acquired him. Like, like, as in Ottawa just didn't mention it. Like, all right, here you go. And they just didn't think to mention it. But the bottom line is, as everyone's been pointing out, you have you have websites like Cap Friendly that have had this on the books. Like, it's there. It, it existed. Everybody knew it was not a secret. It was just you had to, you know, spend five seconds to look for it rather than, you know, not. I would have assumed that, yes, whatever internal... Um, roster management software list you you use if you're an NHL team it should be at least on par with something like cap friendly if not better but apparently it's not <laughs> it's like it's just wild to me I mean as a team you need to have I would think you need to have like just kind of this master sheet uh, yes. you know, board of everybody's no trade list yeah. have that available at all times particularly leading into the uh, the trade deadline. Just have that on file, have that ready to go at all times. You have to have quality control people on this. And, and I believe that Vegas does. From what I've read, it seems like they do have people that are in charge of doing this. It's not like they don't have someone on staff who should be doing this. So maybe there was an oversight. Maybe there was, it was incorrect. Maybe the teams were wrong. You know, I don't mm-hmm. know. But you have to have someone recording this. And then, you know, from the league standpoint, like that's why we have these long, complicated yes. trade calls is to confirm this exact sort of thing. So I, I think the league is not without fault here, too. 
And and I was listening to Elliot Friedman this morning, and he said the number one thing that's going to come away from this trade is that as it is right now, these no trade lists, there is no central registry with the league where these things are monitored and documented. It's all individually with the teams. And certainly after this, that's going to change. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a, an updated registry within the league that they have everybody's no trade lists after this. And that should make sure we don't see anything like this again. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's just one of those things where you wonder kind of how it how it even was like this in the first place. Uh, and until something comes up, you never think about it. Right. And, and everybody's trying to figure out where the blame goes. Ultimately it's on Vegas. You, you they, they the ones who made the trade with a player who had what, what is now kind of con been confirmed a legal, no trade list. That's just the way it goes. Um, I would argue that, you know, forgetting about having a, a master board and all this stuff, like we've all seen all these teams and the GMs, right? They'll have like a big whiteboard with all the players in the two, you know, the club here and the AHL level and everything. You can only have as an NHL team 50 contracts at any given time, like 50 people under contract. Then you have rights and everything. At most, you're going to have what, four or five guys that have some sort of no move or no trade list. You should probably just be able to memorize that or at least memorize that those players have one and so that you can then go into your desk or your filing cabinet and pull it out and look at what those teams are the moment you start discussing a trade involving them. <laughs> like that's what's mind blowing to me. Like forget about it not being like in your system. You should just be able to memorize. If you were Vegas, he was part of four people on your roster that had one of these stipulations in your contract. Just be able to re remember that. Exactly. And and have it down somewhere. And if you're not sure, go double check. Yeah. Well, I guess they had more because they have all these guys buried on injured reserve. I wasn't looking at them. But again, it's <laughs> under 10. You, and, and they're all like top players. Like you just, you know this. It's, I don't know. Um, and if it's on Ottawa, that's just funny too. That like Ottawa just never like, you know, faxed that over as part of the deal or whatever too, just because it's it's Ottawa and it's, you know, we, we kind of expect that from them these days, don't we? Sure do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fun stuff. So be interesting to see how that all goes down. I'm seeing less and less ways of it going down unless he agrees to waive it at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're him, that's going to, that's your personal choice. Um, it's going to be very, very interesting though for Vegas if he decides not to waive it and then this deal just gets canceled because then they've got some cap finagling to do for sure. Yeah, some real cap issues coming for them if they cannot get this deal done. Yeah. Uh, so it, we haven't seen the last of this. No, and also, finally, shame on them for putting him in this situation because he now is faced with the option of waving to go somewhere he didn't want to go. That's why the, the Ducks were on his no-trade list. For whatever reason, everybody's guessing it's probably tax-based, not wanting to play in California. Um but for whatever reason, he decided he didn't want to go there and he earned the right to say that. So you either have to wave to go somewhere that knows you didn't want to go there. Or you got to go back to Vegas that just gave up a second round pick to get rid of you. Yes, and, and having basically thrown a wrench in, in a lot of their plans, yeah. even though it was their own fault. But still, right. that is an awkward situation, no matter how you slice it. And, and I do feel bad for Dodonov at, at this point. Yeah, it's it, he is by far and away in the worst situation. I know if you know Vegas is in a bad situation, if the deal gets canceled, they got to deal with everything. But there is almost no winning way out for him. And and he essentially did absolutely nothing wrong. He was just put in the situation by by multiple clubs, uh, potentially. So, yeah, bummer for him. But that is going to do it for our trade deadline recap show episode special red glare special i think that's what we're going with here um hope everybody enjoyed it hope it lived up to everybody's expectations over tweeting at us getting on us during the uh, post game lives um we had fun doing it we, we definitely wanted to do it as well for for all of you um so hope you enjoyed it thanks so much for joining us and we will see you next time <laughs>